Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 12th. Your show co-hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Our special guest is Wes Fryer, and his topic is inspiring student creativity with media. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will now introduce Wes and ask him the newbie question. We are always excited when Wes Fryer joins us as a presenter on Classroom 2 Live because he always has so many great ideas, tools, and tips for us that really make teaching and learning totally engaging for both students and teachers. If you're someone who's trying to learn how to use Twitter professionally, Wes is the perfect person to follow and model. He is one of the most open, transparent educators I know, and he consistently shares not only his resources, but resources from others. He amplifies and he celebrates accomplishments of students and teachers, and he asks questions that expand conversations and help us to learn even more. Wes Fryer is a teacher, author, speaker, and the director of technology for Cassidy School in Oklahoma City. He's also an enthusiastic supporter and participant in Classroom 2 Live, and he serves on our advisory team. He's the co-host of the weekly EdTech Situation Room web show and podcast. And he also co-leads an after-school STEAM club for elementary students. He taught STEM for two years to fourth and fifth grade students at Independence Elementary School in Yukon, Oklahoma. He's also written several books on how to effectively use digital technologies to communicate, tell stories, create media projects, and develop STEM coding skills. He leads an iPad media camp and <clears throat> shares so many ways that educators can effectively use iPads in the classroom. Wes is a Google certified teacher, an Apple distinguished educator, and a PBS digital innovator. He's helped to organize ed camps. He is also the organizer of the annual K-12 online conference, and he teaches coding and virtual design collaboration workshops for teachers and students. And not incidentally, he's the father of three wonderful kids, and he's married to Shelley Fryer, who is also an incredible tech-using educator. He blogs at Moving at the Speed of Creativity, which focuses on technology integration in the classroom. So thank you so much, Wes, for sharing with us today. So I'm going to ask you the newbie question and then turn things over to you to continue with your presentation. We're all excited to be learning with you today. And here is our newbie question. Why do classrooms need digital sharing spaces for student media projects? Well, what a great question, Peggy. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I would say that as classroom teachers, we recognize the need to celebrate student work and the need to share ideas within our classrooms. And for a number of years now, we have had opportunities to share outside the walls of our classroom. And it is really amazing um, <laughs> when you see the kinds of interaction and sharing that are happening online today, especially with social media. Being the dad of now two teenage girls and a son in college, you know, the amount of sharing that is happening and the ways that they have their relationships and, and, and make connections is just, is, uh, it, it's, it, it can be a little scary at times, but it's also pretty exciting. So there's a lot of reasons for this, but I would say number one, is to help with digital citizenship because we really need to have ongoing conversations with students about how to be responsible and appropriate digital citizens um, and how to 
carry ourselves online, whether we're interacting, you know, just with friends or we might be interacting with a larger community. And then I would say the second reason is we really need to be telling our stories uh, within our community and to a wider community. Classroom 2.0 is just such a great uh, Saturday opportunity almost every week to be inspired and it's thanks to, to teachers sharing their, their projects, sharing their work and you know being willing to step outside the walls of the classroom. So I think inspiration and uh, you know connection with our community but also digital citizenship would be the main ideas or the main reasons for that. So today I'd like to share a presentation with you all that I've called Inspiring Student Creativity with Media. And there really are a lot of reasons why using media and inviting students to use media for assignments and, and to show what they know is so important today. And so whatever grade level you might teach, whatever age of students you work with, or whether you work with teachers for professional development or for coaching, I really think that all of us need to expand our toolbox with media. I was just looking at some posts today about Flipgrid, which is something I've only used a little bit. But it's, it's amazing to see you know, the continued advance of technology but the emphasis here in today's presentation is really going to be using media that students can create and produce to show what they know, to document their learning, to contribute to a digital portfolio, um, and hopefully to inspire their creativity because creativity is so important and, you know, it's up to us as teachers um, to shape the culture that we have in our classrooms. And so hopefully you'll get some practical ideas today for things that you can immediately start doing yourself and you can invite your students to. So Peggy has generously put together a great live binder as she always does for all the resources that will be referenced today. But you can also find those by going to my shortened URL which is wfriar.me uh, slash um, aug12 for AUG12 which is today and that will take you directly to these slides. And these are linked so you can actually connect to these um, on your own web browser as well as later. So uh, just a brief bit about me. I had a chance to share this presentation at the end of July uh, in Kansas at a small, wonderful conference called Cave 8 in St. Mary's, which is about 30 minutes from my hometown. And I had had an opportunity to uh, go with my dad, who lives in Manhattan, Kansas, on a Kansas honor flight um, at the end of June, really just before, before ISTE. And so just as a, as a way of introduction there, I was uh, sharing my, my Kansas roots and also just sharing what a wonderful opportunity, uh, not only, uh, if you're not familiar, a Kansas honor flight started with our World War II veterans as an idea for them to be able to travel to Washington, D.C. to see their memorial, the World War II memorial. And some states have gone on, uh, in addition to bringing all their living World War II veterans, to bringing their Korean War veterans um, and also their Vietnam era veterans. So we had only, I think, one World War II veteran on our trip, but we had two from the Korean War and then we had about 33 Vietnam veterans to include my dad. And so most of the veterans who go on an honor flight have what they call a guardian or an escort um, who's able to be with them and make sure that, you know, they're able to, to get in and off the bus and their luggage and all these kind of things taken care of, but also share in the experience. And I guess one thing I would mention in the context of this uh, is what a what a great opportunity it was to document, uh, right, to take pictures and to share. And I created a, um, an Apple, you know, um, book of photos, you know, for my dad after this was over. And uh, it just, you know, all of the pictures were taken with my phone, which is just crazy because, you know, they turned out pretty good. And it's amazing that we have, you know, such capable technology in our pockets and purses today. So I want to begin today with a question that probably we all have been asked and we may even ask of students when they're in our classrooms as we're getting to know them and getting to know, you know, what is, what is it that motivates them and where do they want to go, what do they want to do. And a lot of times we'll ask students what they want to be when they grow up. And uh, I definitely knew at a very early age I wanted to be a fireman. In fact, I, my mom says that when we would go travel places, you know, I would always ask if we could go to the fire station. And I think I even got to ride up on a, in a snorkel truck a couple times uh, with, with firemen. Uh, little did I know I would, I would grow up to be someone who puts out fires. It's just technology fires as a technology director, not really, uh, you know, physical fires. But 
Um, this is a better question, I think, to ask students today rather than, you know, what do you want to be? And it is, what problem do you want to solve? And this is something that Jamie Cassop, who is the chief education evangelist for Google, shares frequently. And I had a chance to hear him talk in um, August, or no, April of this year in Burbank, California at a, a conference called Atlas. And I have the, the pictures there of, of windmills because it's amazing. If, if you've had a chance to drive across Kansas or to drive in, in parts of the Midwest, uh, Oklahoma for sure, you know, our panhandle, but even central Oklahoma, it's incredible to see how many, you know, wind turbines are all over the place. And when I was home in Manhattan for this conference at the end of uh, July, I talked to one of the good friends, uh, uh, one of my good, the parent, uh, a dad of one of my good friends who still has his, his parents' farm uh, just northwest of Manhattan. And it's incredible. He was telling a story that a Florida-based company that has the largest number of wind turbine uh, energy generators, electricity generating turbines in the United States, uh, has just signed a 90-year contract uh, with them and with other uh, farm owners in that area. And interestingly, there's a community college in, in this part of Kansas called Cloud County Community College, and one of their number one programs today is the maintenance and um, and uh, regular, I guess, lubrication of these uh, wind, wind turbines. And, and out of a two-year program, kids are graduating, I think, to make like $70,000 $70, or something. This is a tough job. This is a hard job. I think it was featured in like dirty jobs on, you know, Discovery Channel or something like that. Um, but we've got all kinds of jobs, and we hear about this, you know, that, that have not been invented and weren't invented 10 years ago, you know, that are, that are coming. And we live in this really dynamic age. And so this is a great problem, I think, or a great question to ask students in terms of what problems that they want to solve. And uh, I would encourage you to find ways to use media and to encourage your students to use media to share, you know, answers to that question. Because where do they really, you know, where, what moves their heart? You know, where, where do they really see that they want to, um, to make a difference? And who knows uh, where that could be and where that can take them. So <laughs> I'm not wanting to have a real slam on, on Catholic education here at all with this picture, so please don't, don't be offended. But I will tell you that in uh, part of fourth grade, I, I had a chance to attend a, a private Catholic school in Mississippi when my, my dad was stationed down there with the Air Force. And, you know, if we, if we think about making uh, school better, I think we need to, to be thinking about making school more engaging, positively memorable, and transformatively empowering. I won't tell you stories today about some of the, the memories I have of rulers and, and of things uh, that go back to that period of time. But I do know that you know we can make learning memorable in a lot of different ways. And one of the best ways to do it is by encouraging students to create and share media. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So when it comes to inspiring student creativity with media, we certainly need to have access to tools. But the good news today is that the price of those tools has come down more and more. And the tools that we may have in our, our pockets or purses that our students may have really you know, can, can have tremendous positive capability for, for documenting and sharing. This is a picture probably from, I think, maybe 2013 in my maker studio where a couple fourth graders were getting some initial experiences with green screen. Um, but you know, that whole green screen setup on Amazon includes three lights and the whole backdrop and everything is like 140 bucks. But you don't need to spend 140 bucks today. You can get a shower curtain, you know, at the dollar store and then you can use, you know, just a regular camera phone or tablet phone in order to record things. Um, this summer I had a chance to play more with We Video up, up in uh, Burlington, Vermont at the Create, Make, and Learn conference. And uh, We Video even has green screen features for, where you can shoot things and uh, be able to, to put other backgrounds in. And so inspiring you know, creativity does have to do with the tools, but a lot more has to do with the ways we're going to use these tools and what we're going to ask <clears throat> and invite students to do. So I definitely want to direct you to the website showwithmedia.com. Um, the first book that I wrote about using media with students was back in 2011. It was called Playing with Media. But what I realized quickly after sharing that with many teachers was that the projects 
that we can create with media are probably the most important. And so this summer, I made two different changes to this original framework, which I started in 2013. And I, I changed uh, Puppet Video, which is still available, but I changed it um, on the front uh, 3x4 grid here to be green screen video. And then on the top, uh, instead of five photo story, I put info pic. Five photo story is still there. It's a great project. But I really think info pics, which I'm going to talk about in a little more depth today, it's a project that every single one of us can do with students, whether we're teaching pre-Ks or Ks, or whether we're you know, teaching high school seniors. It could be something that we do together, something students do you know, independently, but taking an image, putting related uh, text with it, or kind of the reverse, a lot of times we find text we want to share, and then putting an image with it. It's a great project. So please uh, utilize this website, share it with others. When you click on one of these tools, you'll not only see a definition of what it is and some suggested tools, but my favorite part, the examples. And so um, I think, and Peggy, you may be able to help us with the web tour, or uh, I, may, I, I should have asked you about this a little, a little quicker because I haven't done this in a while. Um, maybe we'll just ask everybody to sure. help me out. I what do I do? Because we've got the. the are YouTube you just wanting to show your screen, or are you wanting to play video or something like that? You know what? I think I'll do. Let me just let me just describe okay. it for you guys because I know sometimes with the web tour that takes a little bit of time, and I'll 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 invite you all to play that you know on your own. But this. This particular um, video, which is, um, I guess I just got the QR code for, it's one of my favorites um, from, from two years of going back in the classroom and teaching STEM because these students were doing a little center in a, in a uh, unit we were doing on the science and technology of music and sound, and they were making a string phone, which we've probably all done at some point, where we take two cups and we, we string a string between them, and then we see, it, you know, are we able to have our voice carry across. And it's about a minute and a half long, and there's a lot of excitement. It's somebody's birthday, and we hear you know, about different things before we get to the content. But in the end, we hear the students talk about what makes this work. And there's even disagreement in the video, or, and it's actually an audio recording that they have. There's a picture that goes with it. Um, but in the end, you know, Madison, one of the students, says, it's vibration. The vibration makes it louder. It carries the sound you know, on the string. And this is just a beautiful example because it shows, um, and, this, and especially for me knowing these students, if I had asked these students to write an essay, you know, to put this in text, at this 20-minute center, I wouldn't have had the depth of insight into what they were thinking and what they were learning. Uh, but it really does provide that kind of an opportunity. And it's not super high tech, right? This was an audio recording where we put a picture with it later. You know, it wasn't a video. It wasn't super fancy. But boy, was it great from an assessment standpoint. And it was also just wonderful from an expression standpoint as far as the students being able to express themselves and, you know, de demonstrate what they were understanding and then also demonstrate where they were with their literacy skills. So another thing I was pretty excited this summer to dive into in greater depth was some badge-based learning and some badge-based uh, representation of skills. And so um, this year I shared an iPad media camp up in Jackson, Wyoming with my wife Shelly for about 45 teachers. And we created a badge list group. And badge list is a free website that you can use to create badges and then represent things that you want your students to learn. In this case, projects. And this is the, the badge list description of how you can create a narrated image. And then we also created badges for supporting skills, things that, that teachers using iPads to create media and students need to know how to do, like take screenshots or how to change privacy settings if you don't have your microphone working or things like that. So there's, I love this term, wow work. Um, and actually, let me just ask for the chat, how many of you are using um, a digital portfolio like Seesaw or something else as a digital portfolio. I didn't have that as a, a poll question. But I really think that Seesaw is one of the best tools to use right now because it works on multiple platforms and it allows students to be able to archive their work throughout the year, not only sh you know, sharing it inside the classroom but also outside. One of the things that I've heard Seesaw um, professional development facilitators use is wow work. You know, sometimes student work just really kind of blows you away. And I've learned that the more work students 
are archiving, the more likely it's going to be that they're going to have some wow work, some things to pull out and, and, and for you to pull out and say, look at this, you know, whether that's with the parent conference or whether it's something that, you know, with their permission you share with the rest of the class to really elevate expectations. And so these are all reasons why I think, um, you know, wow work and just archive student work can, can be wonderful because it can, you know, demonstrate the choices that we can have. Not all students necessarily need to use the same um, platform, the same, you know, media product, the, the same option of, of showing what they know. Uh, media can open that window into their mind. It can be simple, right? Keep it simple. Um, and, and really the key is asking good questions, asking open-ended questions, providing chances for students to explore, discover, and collaborate. And then that last lesson has been proven kind of again and again. Sometimes it's at the end of a recording, you know, where the, the best stuff uh, comes. So my question to you now is, what is in your digital media kit? In fact, if you want to post in um, the chat, what is something new that you have been exploring and using in the past summer or maybe in the past year that has been a new tool in your toolkit? I mentioned Flipgrid at the beginning of my session. I've only, I think, participated really in one or two uh, Flipgrid questions, but we've all had different experiences with media, and I think we have an ongoing need to look at tools, and, and tools make us more powerful, right? Um, when, you know, I uh, was, we were doing catapults, you know, for, for STEM class, um, I needed to, to be able to cut up boards, and I had a saw, but I never had a power saw before, and so I went to Home Depot and bought myself a table saw, and I was cutting up board, you know, in my, in my garage. You know, that's, a, that's an analog, physical example of tools, uh, sometimes we have a lot of uh, hesitation and fear when it comes to tools, and it's good to make sure we're using them safely, right? Table saws can be real dangerous, and social media tools and, and these kind of tools can potentially be dangerous too, depending on how we use them. Um, but um, yeah, I see uh, Paula talking about Adobe Spark and the, and the uh, web version of Book Creator, love Book Creator. Uh, Peg is sharing Flipgrid, Seesaw, Flickers, Do Ink. Uh, Book Creator and Spark, all of those are fantastic. You know, if, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Spark, but if you've got younger students without email accounts, that may be something that you use a class email account to do. Um, but not all tools require email, right? And so there's a lot of these tools that, that we can utilize that don't. So today I want to mainly share with you uh, some suggestions for digital tools and some digital pro um, products that you can make. But I also want to talk about <laughs> what I would call a digital magic trick, something that is just so amazing and, and so, uh, you know, in, in, I guess I would say enthralling to, to watch. It could be something that you share with your students, and it could be something you use as a writing prompt. It could be something that you use um, as, a, as a project topic for students to investigate further, uh, and it's uh, something that uh, that Microsoft has created. But let's talk quickly about the, the Eclipse. Um, I'll, I'll ask this for the chat. Do any of you have special plans at school for the Eclipse? I know that one of the important things, and the Eclipse is coming up on uh, in two weeks, right, on Monday the 21st, is really important to make sure that if your students are going to go outside and try to look at the Eclipse, that they're using legit Eclipse glasses. Um, there have been some articles recently about how some scammers have even been selling on Amazon some glasses that are not truly um, safe as far as filtering out the, the ultraviolet light in the sun. You can have permanent damage to your eyes if you're you know, looking at the, at the sun um, without proper um, glasses. And so we're, we're actually going to be starting school on the 23rd. We won't have students in class that day. Um, but the Eclipse provides a great opportunity to do all kinds of, of discussion and learning about science and about geography and uh, about a whole host of things. So this is a free app that's called the Eclipse Safari um, from space.com that gives a lot of great information, uh, details, and suggestions about um, things that you can learn about the Eclipse, ways that you can uh, take your learning further. This, however, is probably my favorite Eclipse website, um, and it's called the Eclipse Mega Movie Project. And so the domain is not a .com, it's a .movie domain, which I didn't even know it was a domain. So it's EclipseMega.movie. And this is a project that Google is behind 
that is going to invite folks to take pictures of the eclipse and then they're going to recreate what the eclipse looks like as it tracks across North America by taking these crowdsourced photos and then putting them together. They've also got a really nice animation showing you, you know, exactly where the uh, full eclipse is going to be going and you can put your location in to see what part of the eclipse that you're going to see. But this just looks really cool. And again, from a collaboration and a sharing standpoint, this is going to be a project that is, you know, amazing and no, no single individual could put this together. This is an example of a crowdsourced initiative. And so it'll be something fun to watch as the eclipse happens and then also to go back after the fact when they put all these things together. But here is the real digital magic trick suggestion for you. And um, this is an app that just came out in July from Microsoft. And I'll give a shout out to Jason Neifer, who co-hosts the uh, EdTech Situation Room show that, that we do on an almost weekly basis on Wednesday nights. And this was one of his geeks of the week a few weeks ago. And it is called Seeing AI by Microsoft. And so I will, um, I will not play the video for you here, just in the interest of time. But um, what you're able to do when you hold this app up, and this is designed for the low vision community. And so you can hold this up to text and have it read to you, but you can also hold it up to scenes and even people. And so I use this at the, the Cave 8 a keynote to just uh, hold it up to uh, one of the one of the teachers, the tech integrator there, and the superintendent. Depending upon lighting, it's it, it oftentimes is kind of close, you know, in terms of saying this is a you know 40 year old um, man wearing glasses who looks happy. Um, but it will you know use AI technology to do its best to recognize what is in the scene. And so this this is a pretty cool, I would say, live demo um, app. Uh, it's also fairly safe. I mean, it may get off, get off on, you know, the age or, you know, elements of what, what they're seeing. Um, but I, I had my laptop for the keynote running the Air Server app, which um, makes a laptop or a desktop computer act like an Apple TV. And so then I was mirroring my phone. And so everybody could see that live. And so again, that may be something that you can take and share with students, share that with teachers for professional development. Um, and I won't play that video, but that's the, the video that's right on the Microsoft um, Seeing AI screen. So artificial intelligence is a pretty big deal. And there are all kinds of reasons to think about why we need to be perhaps doing things differently in school than we might have traditionally done them. Um, but the advent and march of artificial intelligence is one, is one reason. Um, we asked at the beginning of the, of the webinar today, how many of you have some kind of a, of a digital assistant like an Amazon Echo Dot, um, a Google Home? And there were a few folks that, that do. I personally have kind of held off, although I have Siri, and I have Siri on my phone all the time listening. And so personal assistants that are able to take voice input and other kinds of input and then intelligently apply algorithms, this is something that's growing at an exponential rate right now. And we see companies like Amazon, like Microsoft, like Apple, like Google, all racing to further develop their artificial intelligence capabilities. And one of the things, and I didn't put a slide in for this, uh, to know about is Elon Musk, who's one of my personal heroes now, and he's the, the guy who's founded, uh, well, he founded PayPal, he's founded uh, Tesla, SpaceX, and now SolarCity. One of the things that he believes is that we don't want artificial intelligence to only be controlled by a really small group, and so there's a whole um, open AI initiative to try to put this in people's hands. And so I'd ask you to just imagine this today, and this may be the reality in as little as, as 10 or 15 years, or who knows, maybe even sooner, when we have at our fingertips incredibly powerful artificial intelligence agents that can do things for us. I know our girls on, on car trips, as soon as Siri came out, you know, started to try to have conversations with Siri. And Siri could answer sort of single questions, but not connect multiple questions and have a deep conversation. But all of that is really gathering steam. And so uh, one of the things that I'm interested 
pardon me, in, in following, you know, are the, the capabilities of these assistants to, to do different things beyond tell me the temperature, you know, and, um, you know, play, play me a song. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool, right, to just say, hey, play me some classical music and boom, it, or, you know, can I hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? Uh, but what else can it do? And so if you go to the Google Home, uh, Google Assistant homepage, um, there's a there's a really nice grid that you can explore in terms of what kinds of things uh, the assistant can answer today. And I haven't done this yet, but I'm I'm thinking that it would be pretty cool. We have a couple of STEM clubs and a STEAM studio, and and then just with some of our classes that are where kids are studying technology, you know, to get them working on what kinds of questions can the Google Assistant answer or Alexa answer. Um, this gets to the idea that we don't want students just focusing on, you know, fact and recall. Let's think critically about things that perhaps we can't Google and we can't look up. And what's happening today, right, is that the, the, the possible answers to what Google or a Bing search or an assistant can give us are just continuing to expand and grow. And it points to the fact that we want to be creative. We want to be thinking outside the box, thinking beyond, you know, the Google search results. And I think that, you know, using personal assistance and looking at the ways AI is growing is a way that we can do that. So it's kind of a little bit on the negative side, but this is the real world. Many articles today are saying that automation and robots are going to replace a lot more jobs. This is an article from the LA Times uh, back in September of last year saying that robots could replace 1.7 million truckers in the United States in the next decade. Um, back in 2014, 23 states, and I don't know if I've got this, yes, 23 states in, in the United States, the number one most common job was truck driver, right? You'll see that's true for my home state of Oklahoma, up in Maine, down in Texas. I mean, this is the most common job. And what we're learning is that automation, you know, is not only going to make um, the process of driving from point A to point B safer, uh, because we're going to have algorithms that are going to be safer than human drivers, but it's also going to make it less expensive. And so I kind of think there's an inevitability to this. And so a question is, what are we doing to prepare for this? Uh, and I don't think that we're probably doing quite enough. Um, this is maybe perhaps the most dystopian picture I've seen of a self-driving truck, uh, which, as you can see, has no room for a human driver. And so, again, these are things that we can think about, but we can also challenge our students to think about, well, what are we going to do in a world where we're not, you know, where, where automation is, is something that's available to us? And, you know, one of the things we're going to have to look at are what, where can we work? What kinds of jobs are we going to have? Uh, and that's going to rely on creativity and, and innovation. So another uh, link that I would encourage you to check out if you haven't seen is the autopilot on the Tesla website, it's just tesla.com slash autopilot, and it is phenomenally amazing to see all of the analysis um, and all the information that the Tesla car can process to safely be on autopilot. And if you've seen, you know, science fiction movies, you know, Tom Cruise uh, movies or uh, what was it, Ghost in the Shell, I mean, these movies about, you know, futuristic AI, you know, we've got this idea that the cameras are going to be able to identify us wherever we step, you know, outside of our house and, and know all these things about us. Well, there, there is that potential, for, and we don't know exactly how much that is reality today, but this is reality. This is, this is Tesla's self-driving uh, car um, reality. So that's a little bit of your digital magic trick, things to inspire your, your students with. And as Peggy mentioned, um, I'm co-hosting a show with Jason Leifer where we end up talking about some of this stuff from time to time. So you can check that out on edtechsr.com or join us live on a Wednesday night. So if we were together face-to-face, -face, we would do a live demo at this point. Um, and, but I think this would be a great question. In fact, if you want to chime in with an answer, you know, how do you think teaching should change in a world filled with artificial intelligence? because we're not just talking about having access to the library of the world, right? That's how some people have tended to think about the internet and Google. We can look all this stuff up, and that's true, but when we have an artificial intelligence world, you know, we have, we have algorithms, we have thoughts that people have created and written, which are not only able to do complex tasks, they're also able to learn, they're able to change, and they're able to, you know, 
uh, to grow in, a, in an intelligence way uh, with machine learning that, you know, is not, the, these aren't the programs you and I wrote, you know, back in the day whenever we were introduced to coding and, and technology. So I think part of the ways, this is how I would answer this question, we need to change in an AI world is students need to create and share more, not just listen, consume, and regurgitate. We need to emphasize something called computational thinking and creativity. And we need to encourage communication skills across the curriculum. So problem solving, collaboration, design thinking, all of these things are really important, not just for a few students who think they're going to go into computer science or go into engineering, but for everybody. And so hopefully Show With Media is going to, to give you some ideas. And today, I'd like to really focus in on two of these projects, uh, Green Screen and InfoPic, and hopefully give you some more resources that you can take immediately to your classroom with your students to use. So um, how many of you have created green screen videos with students? You can just put into the chat if you have, have made a green screen video. I'll admit to you that I had only dabbled very, very lightly in green screen until 2013 when my, my wife and I went to the Create, Make, and Learn conference, which is an annual institute up in Burlington, Vermont, that Lucy, who is tech savvy girl on Twitter, if somebody wants to drop her, her Twitter into the chat, um, she has organized. And she introduced me to this Do Inc. app, which on the iPhone or the iPad is really transformative. Um, this year we were doing more green screen video uh, using any kind of camera but editing it with Wii Video, which is web-based. And again, I'm not going to play this video, but I will encourage you to check it out. This is my favorite green screen student video of all time. And this is one that my, stu my wife um, helped her students create last year. Uh, for, for February, um, uh, for Black History Month, they were, you know, listening to the I Have a Dream speech by, by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and they wrote their own I Have a Dream. What are the dreams that, that they have for themselves, for their families, for their community? And, oh my gosh, it is just so touching. But because they used a green screen, all of these kids looked like they were in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., you know, giving their presentation. And so um, I encourage you to, to, to check this out and to, to look at this. And obviously, there's a lot of work that goes into this. This isn't just the technology of the green screen. This was some real poignant, very thoughtful writing that the kids had done about their dreams. But it shows the power of media and the power to communicate a message in a much more effective way than they could have done if they were just writing the words on the page and turning that in in a textual format, whether it was, you know, handwritten or whether it was, it was you know, digitally typed. It's just so much more powerful to use media in that way. And additionally, I'll point you to the Badge List group for iPad Media Camp, which you can find at badgelist.com slash iPad Media Camp. And one of the 12 media products there is green screen video. And so you can see the workflow here that uh, would allow your students to create a green screen video. Planning, um, collecting photos for the background, recording their clips, and then adding their green screen effects, combining those clips and then sharing it with others. And I really like that workflow for green screen where you don't, the, the Do Ink app for, for iPad allows you to put the image right behind the, the person talking while they're recording. I think it's a lot better to just record in front of a green screen and then put in the effect later because that way the students might change their mind. They might say, oh no, I don't, I don't want to be in front of the Lincoln Memorial. I want to, you know, um, I want to be, you know, on the streets of Selma, Alabama, you know, in front of a bus or I, I want to be somewhere else as I'm, you know, giving this presentation. And so when you record in front of just a green screen, you can go in later and choose whatever background that you want. So this wow work, I, I think, um, may, I, I personally put it in the area of wow work because it reflects, well, it's, it's touching, right? Like I cannot hardly watch that video um, and, and I almost get emotional. Um, part of that is because I know backstories of these kids, um, which, you know, at my wife's former school, all, her, all the kids are homeless at, at, at Positive Tomorrows at their school. But um, the ways in which students were able to express themselves and to project, uh, you know, not just, not just what they understood cognitively about this is the facts, you know, this is what Dr. King did, 
this is when the the, the um, legislation was passed, you know, for, for uh, civil rights in the United States. But they were really able to connect that with their own lives. Um, it just, it's pretty phenomenal. So I'd encourage you to, to check that out. The last tool that I'd like to talk about here, and we may end up even having some, some time for questions here at the end, which would be great, um, is InfoPIC. And some of you may have not known exactly what I meant by InfoPIC in that poll question, but you have created these before. Um, but InfoPIC is something that, and I'll give a shout out to, to Tony Vincent, I've really seen him utilize InfoPIC so effectively in all of his sharing, in blog posts that he writes, um, tweets that he does. Um, Tony has uh, an Instagram channel where he shares, you know, different ideas and suggestions. So inspired by Tony as well as, as many others, you know, I just thought, gosh, InfoPIC is, is such an important um, product to communicate, and there's a lot of literacy skills that are layered on this. In fact, I'll say one of the reasons, personally, I find digital video, digital storytelling, green screen video to be so engaging is because it is complex, right? There are a lot of layers of what goes into a good video. And that can be intimidating, but it can also be very engaging and exciting for students. And similarly, InfoPIC is simpler, it's on the Show With Media framework, it's higher on that list of, of, of or I guess, the grid of, of 12 products, because the simpler ones are at the top, but it, it still has a lot of layers and a lot of different um, elements to it. So um, I'm not going to share all of these reasons, but this past summer at the ISTE conference in San Antonio, Texas, I did a bring your own device, and it was actually, I guess, bring your own iOS device. Was it? I think it was, yeah. We said, we said bring your iOS device. But you can do these steps on any kind of device. And Adobe SparkPost, which is the app that I use for the demo, this can be, this can be also done on a uh, you know, Chromebook or any kind of browser, because it's a browser-based tool. So there were 10 different reasons why I said why InfoPix, but here are just a few of them. Um, this is an InfoPix that Felix Giacomino, who is a technology director down in Florida, uh, created in April at that conference I was telling you about, and that's Jamie Cassip, who's the chief education evangelist for Google, and that's that question we started with. You know, ask students what problem do you want to solve. When you ask students to do this, okay, to have an idea, this could be an idea from a book they've read, an article they've read, um, you know, a video that they've watched, a presentation that you've done or that someone else has done, you're asking them to jump into higher order thinking because they're going to need to, first of all, find out or figure out what is the content I want to share. They're going to synthesize content and they're going to distill it down to, you know, something that is, is a real bite-sized chunk. Um, doing that is hard, right? It's a lot easier for me to just copy your slides or verbatim, you know, copy something when I've got to apply my own thinking and analysis and then come up with, all right, what, you know, how do I distill this? And then I put this with an image. Um, I would call that hard fun. I've, I've heard the term hard fun used most by um, Gary Steger and others talking about coding and the ways in which coding can be hard fun. But I think media creation with InfoPix can be hard fun in the same way. You know, it's not easy. But it's challenging, but it's, it's fun and engaging in a way that really deepens learning and makes for a memorable experience. And, and that's one of the things we want, right? We want students to engage with curriculum, with content, with ideas, with each other, and we want them to, you know, be impacted beyond the, the 45 minutes or however long that class is. So a second reason, and this is a very basic reason, is that it just increases time on task and engagement, right? So one of the, um, well, I'm going to actually answer Maureen's question. Maureen says, when you do these info picks, how do you redirect the students who play with fonts way too long or combine so many fonts that it's ille illegible? Um, Maureen, I would say, you know, putting some time limits on how long they can spend doing that. Uh, one of my favorite digital storytelling little slogans for students is, you know, it's never done, it's just do. <laughs> so that you can always be making more, more tweaks. I mean, this, this happens with PowerPoint too, right? Students can become derailed 
you know, working on the animations and the transitions and the colors and the fonts and all that so they don't even hardly get to their presentation. So putting some limits on that with time, perhaps putting some specifications. I mean, you could specify a font, you know, you could specify a color, but actually I think it's helpful for students to get into the design of this because they're thinking about the contrasting color, they're thinking about does that, is that font readily readable, um, all of those kind of things. And so yes, it can be a challenge to not be sidetracked with, with all the choices, but again, this is part of the world that we're growing up in that we want students to be able to be effective in is not to be so, you know, distracted by choice that they're unable to, to create. And, and of course they could do this, you know, by hand as well, right? If a student is unable to manage the choices with their apps, you know, we can hand them a piece of paper with some colored pencils and ask them to come up with an icon sketch, you know, and put words with it as well. Um, there's, some, there's, there's a lot of choices, but time on task is a key. If kids are spending more time with, the, with curriculum content, they're probably going to be learning more. Um, did I put all 10 of these in here? I don't think I did, but I guess we're about to find out. Uh, intentionally, um, intentionally connecting words to images is like translating for language. Uh, you're going to be asking students to, um, you know, put it into a visual language when they've been hearing something. It's literally, I'm, it can be, I'm, this, is, this idea comes into my ear, you know, but it, and it comes, you know, but it needs to be processed in my mind and, and it needs to be represented visually. It's a, there's a conversion process that's happening. Okay, I guess I put these all in here, so I just won't spend quite as much time on them. This is kind of a bad example. There's a lot of text on this particular info pic, right? So one of the challenges is how do I synthesize it? How do I cut it down? And so here's a shortened version. And this really happened in Oklahoma. Our, our uh, legislature was, budget committee was asked to vote on a bill uh, within 46 minutes of midnight when, when the whole session was over. It's crazy. So if any of you can help us come to Oklahoma and help our legislature be a little bit more uh, effective and, and follow the democratic process, that would be great. But anyway, I wanted to represent this with an info pick. And so that shows this idea of synthesizing and chunking. Um, I love this idea that we are not in an information economy, we're in an attention economy. Economies are defined by what is scarce, not what is plentiful. Information is plentiful, but attention is not. And therefore, this is, this is something we all need to think about, whether you teach language arts formally or not, is how do we amplify ideas, how do we share ideas effectively when there's so much, you know, distraction and so much you know, information out there. And so you will probably not ever see a, a well-shared piece of media today on, you know, Facebook or on a, on a news website that doesn't have related images, right? That's not utilizing media to be able to amplify ideas. Okay, I didn't put them all on there. So, um, Again, I'm not going to play these videos for you, but one of the things I did in advance of ISTE was I recorded several tutorials. And so you can access the badge list, um, the badge list page on iPad Media Camp for InfoPic, but then you can also um, just access the, a 21, 21 minute, if you want to, you know, wade through that, a step by step video tutorial. So I just took you through step by step of how to use Adobe Spark Post to find an image or insert an image that you found elsewhere, how to add text, how to change the font, how to change the color, how to change the size, and make sure that that text contrasts and, you know, is, 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 is very uh, readable so that it's effective. So here is your homework for today's Classroom 2.0 Live. I challenge you to make an info pick for this. Um, this is a statement I love to share. I believe this. I believe video is the pencil of the 21st century. And so if you want to give a, sh uh, a shout out, use my Twitter ID of at W Fryer or give a shout out just to Live Classroom 2.0, whatever, uh, create an info pic and then share it. And, and if you share it on Twitter, please do use the hashtag Live Class 2.0 and that way I'll be able to find it and others can as well. And we can amplify each other's ideas. We can amplify you know, info picks, we can amplify the, the live class 2.0 um, community, and we can also, you know, amplify the, this opportunity that we have to create info picks. So, uh, in conclusion, I would just ask us to all think, how are we challenging students to prepare for the future? And it's really not just their future, right? It's our future. And hopefully, 
to, in today's session and just your participation in the Classroom 2.0 community, you're, you're continuing to be refueled, you're continuing to be equipped to help students do this, right? Because no matter how many college classes we went through and the degrees we have and initials we have behind our name, there's so much more to learn and there are so many wonderful teachers out there who can inspire us with the projects that they're doing, with the work of their students, and, you know, I think that's what Classroom 2.0 Live is all about. So I would encourage you to invite your students to do these things, to invite them to create, to design, to share, to ask, to demonstrate, to document, to teach, to show, to explain, to collaborate, to risk, all of these things. And I really believe all of those things can be done better when we have media in our toolkit. It doesn't mean we're always going to do the project with technology, but we definitely can, can have a lot, not just a louder voice, but we can have a more articulate voice, we can have a more persuasive voice as we attempt to share ideas and possibly to persuade others about things that we're, we're passionate and we care about. And that is it. So I would be open to any questions that you all want to have. And in fact, I'm, I bet there were questions that flew by. Um, but Lori, if you or others uh, have found, I'd be happy to ask this. Yes, Wes, I did see a few questions. Um, and this was about the seeing AI. Uh, Maureen asked, how does it work? Uh, so you have to be connected mm -hmm. to the Internet, either a Wi-Fi or a data, data signal. And so there are several modes that you'll slide to put it in. So for instance, if you want to just have it read text to you, there's mm -hmm. a text mode. Um, but the beta mode is the scene mode, and that's the one that's kind of fun to, you know, look at different people or your dog or a plant on the ground or whatever. And so what it's doing is it's taking that image, it's uploading it to Microsoft servers, and then it's comparing that image to the other images that it has and doing its best job to give as much information as possible about the scene that's being shared. Mm -hmm. you know, that part is in very much a beta mode, but, um, but the app works. You don't have to create an account or anything. You just tell it what you're going to be pointing your phone at, and then um, you push, push the button in the middle for it to take a picture. And so it processes it and sends it back to you right away. Okay. What do you think about the privacy safety issue with Echo or Google Home? Well, I personally think we all need to be very wary of this age that we're in because of surveillance and privacy. I mm -hmm. shared a TEDx talk in November of last year in, up in Enid, Oklahoma, which I called Digital Citizenship in the Surveillance State. Mm -hmm. I do not personally have one of those devices. I'll do, I do have a, an Echo. Um, I think we need to be really careful. Every Internet of Things device we put in our home to make sure that it has good security. Um, I'm looking to see if it's something, for instance, that, you know, has gone through a vetting process with Apple. We've heard stories about these kid dolls and toys and things. You know, they're so easily hacked. Um, I'm being conservative and not putting, you know, a door lock on our door um, and putting, you know, security cameras inside that, you know, could, could be hacked and those kind of things. But it, there is an inevitability to this, I think, as far as how many of these devices are, are being um, put out into the marketplace and that people are going to be putting into their homes. There's a court case that's a few months old where some police were trying to subpoena the uh, Echo record or, or you know, for the Amazon, um, I think it was an Echo, because there was a murder that occurred in the house and they, they thought, well, maybe there's some clues that were there and we could just get the doc, you know, if Echo recorded everything that was happening, mm -hmm. maybe we could get it. The judge initially said, no, that's, you know, too excessive. But I think that there's real important need for us to be advocates um, under digital citizenship because if we would not be, you know, vocal, uh, um, governments and police agencies and security forces, you know, could utilize these things in, in really, um, in ways that, that, that definitely impede and infringe upon 
our privacy in ways that I don't think we would want. I think privacy is really important. We need to understand that just because we may not be engaging in criminal activity or be a terrorist doesn't mean that the government should, you know, have unfettered access to everything we say no matter where we are. So it's a critical issue. It's a good one to dive into with students. And I think there's going to be different answers that people will have, you know, depending upon where they fall. It, it may not be a tool that they're going to want to, to put in their home, but it definitely is giving us a chance to touch in a very tangible way the power of AI and artificial intelligence. And oops, I think I just accidentally pulled that. Um, and so I think it's it's worth exploring and definitely you know digging into with with other teachers and students as far as what does this mean? What should the limits be for what governments can do? And the choices that we're going to make individually as 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 just citizens and consumers. Okay, and that also means not leaving them on all the time, correct? I would think so. I mean, like I say, I'm not I'm not putting yeah. one in our house, but I do have I have a phone, right? And it's, if I say, "Hey right. Siri," you know, it's probably and I probably just maybe I don't know if I activated that in somebody else. It's funny in podcasts because now you it's it's like Voldemort and he who must not be named. People don't want to say the A word, mm -hmm. the the uh, Amazon, you know, her name, <laughs> because you can be listening to a podcast out loud and it can activate. Mm -hmm. So right, I think you you want to be uh, thoughtful about where you have these devices, and um, it, it also comes down to a matter of trust, right? Do you trust Amazon and Jeff Bezos? Do you trust Google? You know, who do you trust because you are sending them a ton of information. Right. Um, but that's how artificial intelligence really, uh, that technology really grows is by huge amounts of data being put into to databases. And so I think there's, a, there's an inevitability to, inevitability to the development of these technologies, but we certainly have, you know, choices that we can make about the degree to which we're personally involved with them. Mm -hmm. Are info picks and sketch noting synonyms? No, I don't think so. I, a sketch note would be something that you're hand drawing, and it's uh -huh. not necessarily um, it doesn't necessarily have text with it. A sketch note could be purely visual, uh -huh. so you could make an info pick out of a sketch note. But I think I mean not that you have to get caught up too much in the semantics, but an info pick is going to include both an image, whether it's a photograph or something you know drawn, as well as text. So a sketch note, you know, could be similar, but info sketch notes are oftentimes a little more complex as far as the ideas that they capture, and info picks, I think, tend to be simpler. They're usually, you know, a phrase, a word, you know, and then an image that goes with that. So okay. there, there is overlap. Um, generally, with most info picks, I'm I'm seeing them, you know, used with photographs rather than drawings or sketches. But there's a lot of overlap in, in these different media products. And I definitely think adding voice narration, whether that's to a sketch note or to an info pic, you know, can be a great additional extension to that media project. Okay. Eileen asked, can we post the info pics on the Google Classroom? And I'm not sure if that was related to the homework or the, the challenge that you sure. gave or... Sure. Well, well, I would say we don't. I don't know that we have a Google Classroom like for Classroom 2.0 right. live. So I would say just I would just share share them on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. If you can post it on Twitter with the the live uh, Class 2.0 hashtag. But in terms of your own students, yes, the uh, mm -hmm. finished info pic is a flattened image, probably a JPEG image, and so that could be uploaded as a file within Google Classroom or within you know Canvas or you know, whatever learning management system, uh, Seesaw, I mean, it can, be, it can be uploaded and shared just like any other file or image. Okay. Uh, do you have a webinar just on InfoPic? I know in the Live Binder you had a, a tutorial video. Right. Uh, well, the closest thing I have is if you go to the Show With Media site, the mm -hmm. showwithmedia.com, um, I've got that tutorial video there, then also a recording of the Why Info Picks. Um, okay. And I'm actually working on developing an online course um, for Show With Media, so that's mm -hmm. still in the idea phase. But the, the, the closest I have are those recorded videos that you'll find on showwithmedia.com. Okay. And Peggy has posted those those links again. Those were the questions that I was able to capture that you had not answered during the presentation, Wes. So thank you so much for presenting today. I think everybody learned a great deal.
And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up. That was incredible, Wes. Thank you so much. And now we have not only have a homework assignment, but we have a whole lot of resources that you have shared with us that we can go back and learn at our own pace about all these things you've talked about. So thank you. We have a great show coming up next week. Jennifer Judkins, an amazing Google user, is going to be sharing tons of ideas for ways you can use Google Forms in your classroom. So I'm really looking forward to that. August 26th, we have the amazing Jennifer Casatod joining us. She has just published her new book, Social Media, and it's all about ways that you can integrate social media into your classroom and your curriculum. Whether you have issues with blocking or not, she has tips for you. So that's a show you won't want to miss. And then we won't have a show September 2nd because that's Labor Day weekend in the United States. So I hope that you will all come back and join us next Saturday. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkett on Slatest. He's gathered all his resources into one place, including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a session just like this one. As long as your session is public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site. The tab is also in the live binder. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collection is on iTunes U from the recordings. Uh, as you exit the session, the survey link should open up, or you can take the link in the chat. Uh, the link is also in the live binder. And at the end of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out with your name, thanks to Patty Ruffing, and Patty sends them out. Please make sure, if you request a certificate, that you use a personal email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks. Again, to our special guest, Wes Fryer, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.